So I got to tell you a daylight saving story. So this morning we woke up early because, you know, what my phone says is six is five, right? So I'm getting all my stuff ready for the morning and I'm tying up my shoes. I'm getting ready to get out the door and it's, it's early. And we have this uh, turtle. He's a yellow-bellied slider. He's a little over a year old. And um, his light turns on. We have it on an automatic timer. Well, it turned on at 7 o'clock. And it's really 6 o'clock. And he was still asleep. And he looked at me at the couch and was like, What are you doing? It is not time to get up. Everybody gets affected by daylight savings time, don't they? It's just like a really crazy thing. So we are going to hope and pray that we only have to do it this one time, and that's it, right? And we'll get that all done and over with. Anywho, we're going to be in Luke chapter 13 today. We're going to be in the last part of the chapter. And uh, before we get going, I want to tell a story. It's, it's an Aesop's fable. Maybe you've read it in school. You read the different, different fables in school. This one's called The Rooster and the Fox, and I want to read it for you. One bright evening, as the sun was sinking on a glorious world, a wise old rooster flew into a tree to roost. Before he composed himself to rest, he flapped his wings three times and crowed loudly. But just as he was about to put his head under his wing, his beady eyes caught a flash of red and a glimpse of a long pointed nose. And there just below him stood Master Fox. Have you heard the wonderful news? cried the fox in a very joyful and excited manner. What news? asked the rooster very calmly. But he had a fluttery feeling inside of him, for, you know, he was very much afraid of the fox. Your family and mine and all other animals have agreed to forget their differences and live in peace and friendship from now on forever. Just think of it. I simply cannot wait to embrace you. Come down, do come down, dear friend, and let us celebrate this joyful event. How grand, said the rooster. I am certainly delighted at all of the news. But he spoke in an absent way. And stretching up on his tiptoes, he seemed to be looking at something afar off. What do you see? Asked the fox a little anxiously. Why, it looks to me like a couple of dogs coming this way. They must have heard the good news and... But the fox didn't wait to hear anymore. Off he started on a run. Wait, cried the rooster. Why do you run? The dogs are friends of ours now. Yes, answered the fox, but they might not have heard the news. Besides, I have a very important errand that I must have forgotten about. And so the rooster smiled as he buried his head in the feathers and he went to sleep. For he had succeeded in outwitting a very crafty enemy. Now, what is the moral of the story? The moral of the story is that the trickster can be easily tricked. And that is what we're going to be looking at today. Luke chapter 13 and verse 31. It is a story that has many different things in it. And we're going to read through it. Starting in verse 31. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus, and he said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, You go tell that fox. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day. For surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
You who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, at your, look your house is left to you desolate. I tell you that you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So we're getting to the end of Jesus' life here. He's returning to Galilee. He's heading to Jerusalem. He's going through town after town after town, talking to different people. But apparently at some point in time, he wasn't moving quick enough for the Pharisees because the Pharisees had told him to get out of town. And so what they said was, leave this place, go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. Kind of like the fox, right? Let's just be friends. Herod wants to kill you, right? Now, was this a warning from the Pharisees? Do we know if he actually did that? Or was it a way of just saying, get out of here. We don't need you anymore. You need to go somewhere else. And whatever the case is, Jesus, he knew their hearts, and he sent them a message. And here's what he said. He said, you go tell that fox that I am going to succeed in all of my goals in life. I'm going to continue to drive out demons. I'm going to continue to bless people. And on the third day, I'm going to reach my goal. He is not going to let anything come in his way in life. He is going to succeed. But it really didn't seem like in this story very much happened, did it? No one was healed. There was no miracle that was performed. There was no profound teaching in any of it. He just said, get out, right? Jesus was informed that the Pharisees were going to get him. So there's the religious powers, right? And then he, said, then he heard that Herod was going to get him. So there's your political powers, right? And to top it all off, there was no safe place at this time for Jesus to come to. He had exceeded all, all areas of life where he could go. And so what does he do? What does Jesus do? He always does it. He does it every time. He just keeps doing what he does. It's Jesus. Amen? I know you guys are tired. It's, it's daylight savings time. I get it. You all look exhausted out there. Like you really do. I'm trying to be excited for you. But uh, just hang tight, all right? Jesus knows all of this. What does he do? He just keeps going. Not the Pharisees, not Herod, not even Jerusalem. Now, we have to understand that Jerusalem, when, when a prophet, when a disciple, when anybody would come to Jerusalem, they would kill them. They would be done. They would, not, they would stop him from pressing forward. And he knew what lay ahead for him. Jesus knew what was going to happen, right? He knew that on the third day he was going to raise. He knew he was going to have to die on the cross, But he kept going. He kept trying to reach his goals in life. He let nothing stop him. Have you ever been stopped in life from reaching your goals? Maybe it was a health condition. Maybe it was a person. Ooh. Maybe it was just life circumstances. Jesus said, "Uh -uh. uh-uh, uh-uh, I don't care what life throws at me, I am going to reach my goal. And what was his goal? What was Jesus' goal in life? He had one goal in life. It was the only goal that was going to help any of us, right? He had one job, and that was to save us, right? Right? If anything would have gotten his way, if anybody would have tried to stop him, if he would have thought something differently about life and said, I don't know if I want to do that, we would not be here today. We would not have eternal, eternal salvation. But Jesus said, we are all important. We are all important to him. He loves us so very much. And he was willing to do everything, sacrifice everything for you and for me. You see, here's what's an interesting thing about Jesus is that Jesus always continued to take people under his wing. 
He kept wanting to serve people. He kept wanting to be a part of their lives. And so when you do that, I was thinking this week that when somebody takes you under their wing, it's kind of like a job, like an apprenticeship, right? Have you ever been in an apprenticeship? So they're an apprenticeship, they take you under their wing, they teach you the ways that whatever it is that you're doing, and then they send you off to do the same thing, right? And so then you take somebody under their wing, your wing, and then you teach them the things, and then you go on and on and on. So there's this issue, this thing that happens. You have to trust the person that you were brought, that was, that was over top of you, that you, you had to trust them that you were being given the right information. You had to understand that what they were doing was the right way. Did you ever have a wrong teacher in your life? A wrong wing that you were under? And you were sitting under the wing and you were thinking, why in the world am I under this wing? Just for record's sake, that will never happen with Jesus. He's the only one that that won't ever happen to. You see, Jewish tradition, here's what they claim. They claim that Jewish people, they were under God's wing. And so when a Jewish, Jew, Jewish person converted into a Gentile, he or she would bring the Gentile under their wing of God's presence. And so this Old Testament, it portrays God as an eagle hovering over top of its offspring, protecting Israel in Deuteronomy and Exodus under his wings and similarly terrifying Israel's foes. I can't imagine, I, I can't imagine. Can you, can you just dream and, and think of God as this giant eagle hovering over top of each and every one of us, protecting us from the arrows that might be fired in our lives, protecting us from the fire that might rain down, whatever the case may be. God was there for Israel's people. He's there for us. He's over top of us, protecting us. And, and this is just one image of God's love for his people. And so here's what Jesus did in this situation in Luke chapter 13, is he applies it to himself, and he says, I want to be that wing for you. I want to hover over top of you. I want to be there for you. And so here, I have a question for you. What are the things in your life that keeps you from reaching your spiritual goals. Your spiritual goals. So in my life, I have two types of goals, physical and spiritual. Now in the physical goals, we have a lot of things. Currently, I want to do, I have two goals in life for my physical goals. I want to get healthy. COVID took a toll on my body. I want to get back to normal, exercise, eating right, thinking right, feeling happy about life, not being burdened by whatever's happening in the world, just zoning it all out, getting off of social media, because that stuff's nonsense, and just being me again. That's the physical part. And I want to retire. <laughs> That's the other physical part. All right, I'm serious. I'm too old to be young, but too young to be old, right? Remember that whole conversation? We're thinking about retirement. We, we, we need a goal, a physical goal for retirement, right? So those are my physical goals right now. Spiritually, I want to be a better pastor. I want to be a better mentor. I want to be a better teacher. I want to read my Bible so that I can pray more, praying often, as, as Scripture says, right? Praying more and more and more every day. I want to bless people with every blessing, every spiritual blessing that I could possibly do on a person. I want to do that. I want to be there for people more. I want to raise and lift people up every single minute of every single day. And so from a spiritual aspect, spiritual goals, those are the two things that I want to do personally. This isn't a psychology or, a, you know, 
I just want to let you guys know that that's what, what's going on in my life. So there are two goals. And so the one that I want to ask you is, what are your spiritual goals in life? And, and what's keeping you from attaining those spiritual goals? There's always blockades. There's always things that are happening. You know, we, we trust in the Holy Spirit to work through the Word of God. And we believe Jesus when he says, blessed are those who hear the Word of God and obey it, right? Blessed, we, we've read it a lot. Blessed are those who hear the word of God, but the second part's the hard part, right? And obey it. But sometimes when we say these words, just listening to the word of God, and the word of God is powerful, when those become more than just phrases in our life, and from a spiritual aspect, it starts impacting our lives, we change. The word of God is precious, the good news is awesome. The word of God is powerful. But reality is there's all these things that always keep us from listening to it. Speaking all of the different things. We, we know it when we say it. And we believe that God provides. And God provides generously to, the, to us so that you, we could be generous on every occasion we pray continually, we try to pray continually in Paul's admi admonition, right? He says that, but here's what we say. We get through all of this spiritual stuff, and here's what we say. I'm too busy. Aren't we all busy? You know, here's what, here, here we're not busy, Okay. We're not busy. Here, here's the fun thing. I always ask people, you know, like we walk in passing people, hey, how's it going? I'm pretty good. Keeping busy. Keeping busy. Why do we have to keep busy? Why do we have to keep, oh, I got all of these things going on and plans and timing and this and that and all of this stuff. I'm just too busy to pray. I'm, I'm just too busy to read my Bible. I'm just too busy to, to, to serve people in the community. I, I'm just, I don't have enough time for this. I, I, I can't do all of it. Can't we just, can't we just all just leave everything aside? Can't we just accept everything? Can't we just all just be busy and just not worry about anything else? You see, he, here's what keeps us from achieving our spiritual goals. It's busyness. It, it, we're too busy for all of it, right? We, we want to blame everything else. We want to blame all the outside forces. We want to blame all of the stuff that's going into our lives, all the nonsense that's happening in reality. But, but you know what keeps us from, our, from, from, from all of the spiritual goals in our lives? It's us. I am the only person that could keep me from reading my Bible. Amen? I am the only person that could keep me from praying. Nobody could stop me. I could pray whenever I want, right? Fire me from praying. I was being silly. That was a joke. You guys are asleep. Take a nap. We're almost done. You see, here, here, here's where I am. I am in the... I am in the young adult phase of my life, and so I am beginning to learn more and more and more that when I learn life lessons in my life, I learn them the hard way. Here's an example. I took a job one time that made me a lot of money, really, really fast, a lot of money, but you know what happened? I got busy, and I spent a lot of time doing this job, and I made a lot of money. And let me tell you, I could have bought all kinds of fun things, but did I have time to enjoy them? No way. I couldn't know. There, there was no way. My family members, friends, people of this church told me, do not take this job. Don't do it. And I said, but look how rich I'm going to be. Lots of money. I'm telling you, like, I've never seen so much money in my entire life. I got so tired. 
I got so worn out of people. I got so busy with my work life that I forgot about my family life, let alone my physical life, let alone my spiritual life. And it was all about my job. But I made a ton of money. So what happened? I got burned out, I quit, and I jumped eight jobs in a year just so that I could find a job where I could be with my family and pray and read my Bible and be physically healthy again and get back to the normal season life. The world is not about money, right? The world is about the spiritual aspect So Jesus, he faced a couple of these oppositions that we've just been talking about. He faced secular oppositions. He faced religious oppositions. And what's remarkable is Jesus is not concerned about any of it, and he does not care. He continues his work. He continues what he's called to do. He continues on with his goals in life. And here's what he says. He says, I'm going to keep doing it until... You say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He says, I'm not done yet until you say those words. Blessed is he who comes in the day of the Lord. Jesus, he was not afraid of Herod. He was not afraid of the Pharisees. He was not afraid of any job that he had. He was not afraid of the people who were going to come into his life to persecute him. He wasn't afraid of anything. He just said, here's what I'm going to do And you can either like it or not like it. I wish I could be that way, but I'm a people pleaser. And I pray through that every day. He just wasn't afraid about life. He just went on with his mission. He continued on into his goals until he made it. So he came, he talked, he walked, he was here. He, he, as he thought about all of those who would reject him, his reaction wasn't anger, right? He wasn't concerned about, oh, I'm so mad that all of these people don't believe me. His reaction when he came and he walked and he talked and he tried to learn what was going on with people was he was sad. He had sorrow in his life. He wasn't mad at the people for not, paying, not being a part of his life. He was sad. He, here's how we know it. in our scripture. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you. It, it, it wasn't an angry phrase like, Jerusalem, come on. It was like, oh, like why do you do this? I'm so sad. How often have I longed, Jesus said, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks together under their wing? You're just not willing to do it. It was for sinners like us that Jesus came here in the first place. It was for our salvation that he kept going. Jesus knew that Jerusalem and the people of Israel had a track record of killing these prophets and stoning those who sent them. So it raises a question. It raises a question when we read these scriptures about God. Here, here's the question. If I was Jesus, I would ask this question. Why are you going to send me to Jerusalem of all places? You know I'm going to die. Why not send me to like a happy place like Canada? They're always happy up there. Why would God line up messenger after messenger, prophet after prophet, person after person to face rejection and death? And then why would you send your son to this place to the terrible end? And when he gets there, you would think everybody would know Jesus, right? Here comes the king. Here comes the guy, the savior, right? Here he comes. Jerusalem is getting there. We got Herod here, and here's the question that I would ask Jerusalem. Why would anyone want to kill Jesus? Why would you want to kill the one who's going to come and save your life? Have you ever done that in your life? 
Why would you want to kill the one who wants to have an eternal relationship with them? The one whose sole desire is to draw you close to him so that he could protect you, so that he could be the eagle, so that he could come over you and protect you through the storms of your life. Why would God put up with all of that? Why would it happen? Well, there's two reasons. Here's one. God's word and his promises are true. Jesus had to die. And here's the second one. His love for you and for me, it has no limits and no boundaries. And God will stop at nothing and will continue to stop at nothing, not even sacrificing his one and only son to save us all, to help build a relationship with him. We must do that as Christians, spread the good news. There, we'll put a little two in there, two people. Spread the good news to people. And we can do that because we're a free country, amen? I can stand up here and, and preach freely, and nobody's going to come and persecute me from the government, right? I can do it. But what would happen? What would happen if the United States became hostile to Christianity, what would happen if for one reason or another, we got everything as Christians taken away? Our tax-exempt status, heaven forbid we have to pay taxes to the government, right? Take all of this stuff away. What if they oppose all of our principles as a Christian church to such a degree that they would come in here and shut this church down and send us all away to prison? What if we face all of this opposition? What would we do? We would proclaim the good news to all people. Amen? What if in the name of religion we're mistreated and persecuted? We get that right now, don't we? What if, in the, what if Islam became and continued to grow in such a degree that we as Christians are oppressed? We're almost there. What if a false brand of Christianity emerges that seeks to, to destroy true, authentic faith? We're there, people. We're there. Like Jesus models for us, we must continue to boldly proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, even on Daylight Saving Sunday. <laughs> the reason that we have all of this confidence is because we come, as Scripture just said, blessed are me he is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We do it. We are his followers. We have a message to tell. We have a story to get out there. We have his power inside of us. We are under his wing. He will protect us. And we must, as a Christian family, continue to strive to bring the good news to all people. And we should not stop until all of his work is done. And do you know when that day is? When he comes back for us. We will not stop. Not stop, can't stop, won't stop. Ever. So it's my prayer today that you will go out of here with boldness in the name of Jesus Christ and proclaim the gospel to all the nations and to not stop, and don't let anybody, secular, religious, anybody, stop you from achieving your spiritual goals in life. Do it with passion, do it with fire, do it with fervor, and then go home and take a nap. Amen? Heavenly Father, we want to lift you up this morning. We thank you so much for today, for your power, for your spirit. And I pray that we can have the awesome strength that you gave Jesus in this situation. Father, that we could tell all of the foxes of the world 
that we've got a story to tell and goals to reach, and there is nothing that can stop us. We are going to continue to pray for people, Father. We are going to continue to bless people. We are going to continue to reach people in our community. I pray that this word may sink into our hearts today as we go out into the world. It's in your loving, gracious name that we pray all of these things. Amen.